Okay, with the engine pods now completed as far as we want to at this stage, we're now moving to steps five and six, which deals with fitting of the bow thrusters before the two hull halves go together. Now, I've just been having a play with this, uh, and there is a decision to be made now about whether you want those thrusters open or closed, and there's a number of reasons why you need to make that decision. Um, the first reason is the um, way of working these um, is that they're fitted without any glue um, and as you can see here the idea is it pivots on a butterfly hinge um, and so that you can have the doors open or closed just like on the real ship. The reality is um, the doors don't really fit. So um, you you want to fix them in either an open or closed position. And whether you're going open or closed, you're going to have to do some work on the doors um, to make them right. Um, so you're going to have to do some shaping to make them fit if you want to have them closed. And if you want to have them open, we've got some modifications to do to both the doors and the hull. So let me just take you through that now and then you understand what needs to be done for each solution and then I'll tell you what my thought process is. So, if you want to have these um, shown as closed, then my recommendation is, because of the way these, these fit, i show you. There's, uh, you push it through. Let me get it right way around. You push it through the opening from the back, um, and then it's supposed to close. But actually, it doesn't fit inside the hole, so it's not going to close properly. So you're actually best. Cut off the two location tabs at the end um, and sand this into shape. And because you've got that little recess at the top there to locate it, you can carefully glue it in and seal it up and make it look right. If you want to have them open, then you've got quite a bit more work to do. Firstly, on the door, the hinge goes right the way across. Now, on the real, um, on the real ship, the hinge is only probably about one to one and a half millimeters wide. So, wide. So you want to cut out the center section, and that will make these a lot more visible. The propellers, because at the moment that is so thick that it blocks much of the view um, into the tunnel. So that's the first thing you have to do. The second thing is um, you're going to need to put um, a little um, recessed angle all the way, or pretty much all the way, around uh, the opening of the tunnels. Um, so what happens is when the um, to to allow these to fit flush, um, there's a recess that the door closes into. Um, and that is only visible when the door is open. So what we're going to have to do is um, file um, a little edge in all the way around. Um, but also, we need to remove that. The problem is, if we remove that, we will then see this part behind it. So by far the simplest solution is to just glue those up, um, which means you also don't need to spend time painting those. Um, so, yeah, as you can see, the, the part is designed to line up perfectly with what has been done in there. So, um, if we take that back at all, um, then we lose um, that, that opening, will expose 
the top of that like so and it won't look right so what we're gonna have so that basically the tunnel isn't really the right shape and when you look at it you realize that it's actually perfectly circular but the actual tunnel shape isn't or the door shape isn't so there's a bit of work to do um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and have these open um, so I'm going to mess around with the hull um, with one of these and make it work and then when I've got that solution I'll come back to you and show you what that solution is um, my worst case scenario is I can't make it work and we end up gluing those permanently shut but at the moment you've got a soft mould edge that rolls into that tunnel anyway so we want to sharpen that up so doing the bottom is not a problem and we may end up putting filler into this top so we could put the chamfer in um, and that might well be my, my preferred uh, way of working here. So we have two parts that make up the tunnel um, with a flat surface which mates against this part which has the actual um, thrusters on. So by just test fitting we can see that the only thing we're going to have visible on this part is inside this recess. So we can paint this part separately um, and then fit it. Um, then we've got butterfly doors which will go on the inside of the hull um, and this will go uh, against them. So you've got to make the decision whether you want to have them open or closed. Now I don't know whether they're going to be movable. I think they probably are which means that we can then um, decide what we want to do uh, and we may be able to close them for painting which will allow us to um, mask the area or we, we may not and have to um, come up with a solution for masking these tunnels but uh, we're going to paint the inside of these tunnels in the same way as we've painted the engine pods with um, one coat of uh, pink primer and then two coats of um, the carmine red um, but these need to be painted um, the uh, silver for stainless steel and then the background needs to be um, black because actually these this would be an open tunnel and you'd be able to see all the way through um, the tunnel normally. So we don't need to um, worry about these ejector pin, pin marks here in the surface because um, they're not going to be visible, neither will these lips be. Um, I am going to just trim the, the nubs back, but we don't even need to clean the parts up particularly. So I'm going to be using a gloss black primer for these parts. Um, and because these parts are quite small and will be difficult to see, um, I'm able to just brush this. Um, and the primer we're using... Um, is suitable for both airbrush and ordinary brush painting um, and I've not thinned this at all it's coming straight out of the bottle um, unthinned um, and you'll see the coverage is actually really really good we will need more than one coat um, partly because we're going down onto a white um, substrate and partly because the um, primer is slightly thinner than you'd possibly imagine it would be. Now we're using the gloss because it helps the um, metal shine come through um, when we um, paint these propellers um, it'll just help with the with the look. It won't make any difference to the black background that we intend to have behind the propellers. Um, which will be um, suitably matte finish whereas we will probably set in gloss the uh, propellers when we're done so you can see there the propeller starting to stand out quite, quite nicely now um, so we can flip that over um, the, the uh, propellers are nice and crisp um, 
so we'll look really quite nice once we've got these painted up okay we'll let that dry and then we'll give it a second coat a primer is now dry so our next task is to actually paint the propellers in um, now to do that I am using this um, MIGS um, steel colour uh, from their um, metal acrylic colour range uh, and I believe this will give me um, a really nice stainless steel type of finish. So I'm using this straight from the bottle uh, without any thinner um, and it brush paints on quite nicely like that. So there we have our uh, propellers painted up. They look suitably silver and shiny. Um, and any uh, touch up that we need to do around the edges of the propeller can be done when we're painting the matte black in the background. Um, these should be quite visible now when we put them um, into the back of the um, tunnels. So let's just have a look at that okay I'll get the other side done and then we'll come back to you traditionally large ships maneuvered to and from their berths using tugs and these can be quite expensive, especially for a large ship where you may need three tugs on the bow and, say, three tugs on the stern. And so ship owners look for a way of dispensing with the, the need for tugs. And the Oriana of 1960, she was the first passenger ship to have side thrusters installed. And she had two bow thrusters and two stern thrusters albeit ra rather low power in those days. Now Queen Mary II, because she has the two azimuthing mermaid pods at the stern, we've got enough power to push the ship sideways at the stern using those mermaid pods, so we don't need any stern thrusters. But in the bow, there are three large bow thrusters these are 3.2 megawatts each, so that makes 9.6 megawatts in total, which in fact um, is as much power as many ships have in their main engines. And these thrusters, the three of them, these are fitted in tunnels that run across the bow of the ship under the waterline, and they're closed off by butterfly-style doors when the ship is running anything above about five or six knots. And the reason we have doors fitted to the Queen Mary thrusters is that because they're so large and the openings are so big, 
it would have caused a lot of drag and resistance with the water swirling around those tunnel entrances. And so like the QE2 before her and the Oriana and the Canberra, I decided that um, we should fit doors to the Queen Mary II thrusters. And these are depicted on the Revel 1 to 400 kit. So we have a solution, um, and it's actually not that complicated. So I'm just holding these tunnels in place at the back. So you can see I've removed the lip off the lower one of the thruster doors, the top lip that retains the door and stops it falling back on itself. Um, so that's that was simply removed using a half round file. In fact, that's what I've used for all of this. Um, then I've gone round with a half round file and put a small shallow chamfer all the way around except the points where the hinges are. Because if you look at the actual ship, um, it's squared off where the hinges are. So the chamfer is only on the top and bottom areas of the doors, so like two U shapes. Um, and then what we've done is, um, once we've done that, we have taken the file and put a, a chamfer on the inside of the tunnel so that it meets up with this top edge here. And you can see by the amount of um, material that's been taken away there from this edge right the way up to that line. It's about, I'd say, four millimetres at its deepest point that we've gone back on the chamfer. But by doing it gradually, it's not noticeable. And when it's painted and the door's in there, you won't notice that we've widened the front of the tunnel and that the tunnel's in actual fact getting slightly narrower as it goes along. So uh, that's quite an easy solution. So I'm now going to modify the door next so you can have a look at that completed uh, modification. So that's my first bow thruster door and tunnel completed. Um, if I show you the comparison, um, you can see what a difference it makes removing the centre section of that hinge. Um, and you can actually see a lot more of the propeller now with that hinge cut down um, and it looks a lot more authentic than it did. There is a slight chamfer on there as well, it's ever so slight. That's probably the trickiest thing to do in, the, in this. Um, but yeah, I'm happy with that. So um, now I have my solution. Um, I will go away and clean up the rest of them um, ahead of putting the two hull halves together. So uh, we're still on step five and six. Um, what we've done is opened up the um, bow thruster door openings in the hull. As we talked about, all three of those are done now. We've modified the three um, doors. So we're now ready to glue them in place. Now, obviously, the instructions are telling you to leave them um, loose, but they really don't fit particularly well. So. Um, I'm going to glue them in place and then we'll glue the tunnel around them. So I'm just going to put some liquid poly uh, down in the hinge joint. That's all the only place we're going to put any glue. And then whilst that is still uh, wet, we're going to position the bow doors as we want. which is fully open, it should give us the best shot, uh, best view of the propellers there, inside the tunnels.
there you have them. So we'll just let that set um, and then we can have a look at putting the tunnels on. So using this half round file we've um, just um, taken out some material out of the top of the tunnels. Um, like I said before, all three are now done. Um, so we can now just gently pop these into position. I have just checked it so I know that um, I've got everything right in terms of wall thickness and the look of this. So we can now get this glued into place. thrust doors and tunnels done on the starboard side. Now the starboard side is going to be left like this so this bit of hull is um, pretty much ready for being glued together. The other side of the hull we've got some other plans so we've got one or two things we need to do to that so let's have a look at that. Okay, so first thing to say is don't be tempted to start sanding all these seams while the hull is in two halves. The danger is you can take material out of this and then when you glue them together it doesn't match and you're then spending a lot of time blending. Whereas if you do it once the hull is together, you're dealing with both sides at the same time and keeping everything nice and level. Um, but what we do need to do before we put the two halves together um, because it'll be easier to do it now, is clean up any flash that there may be around any of these little windows. And then if there's anything in the hull we want opening up, we should do that now as well. And we certainly want to do that. So there is a little door you can just see. I don't know if we can get that in the light. But there's a little door there, and that is for the crew to... Um, stand out on a little platform and see the progress of guide ropes coming in. Um, so what we need to do is check any of these that we want to open. So that one we want to open up, so we're going to need to cut it out and then probably thin out the material on the inside. Um, there's all sorts of loading doors here and you must understand how they operate, when they operate, which would be open um, uh, together and which wouldn't ever be open if the other one was and all of that type of thing. So you've got all of that to work out. And then there's these two rectangular doors at the bottom here and those are for the tenders um, to moor up to, so to take passengers to and from shore or or wherever. Um, so you can model those open and been considering whether I want to do that or not and I'll be honest I've not made a final decision so while I'm cleaning up this and going around and rescribing some of these holes and, uh, and grooves and, and so on then um, we'll think about it. If we open that up we've got to make some modifications to dab it um, assuming that the tender's launched um, and, then, and then we've got to consider what we would do with the tender so there's lots to think about as well as building inside the ship what is there uh, which is really a staircase and, and, a, and a wooden platform so some things to think about um, and you really need to be thinking about that at this stage 
So one of the other things that we need to do before we put the two halves of the hull together is just check all the uh, panel lines are correct. So if you can see here, um, I've got some panel lines that are quite poorly moulded and not very deep. Um, so we need to um, just deepen those so that they, they look well the same depth as everything else. So I'm using um, Tamiya's plastic scriber 2 for this job um, and it's a, a bit of a tricky tool to use. Um, the secret is to not press down too hard and just let it do its thing lightly. Um, if you press down hard it's very easy to slip and then you end up having to uh, fill and sand down grooves that you made where you didn't intend to have grooves. If you've not got one of these, the tip of a saw blade will do just as well. Or even the corner of a sharp knife. Um, I've certainly tried that and and that's worked for me. Okay, so anywhere where we think we've got a bit of soft moulding and that the uh, panel's a bit light, we'll just go over that and uh, redefine it. You can see here on the bow, it's particularly poor. So these absolutely need Defining. If we sand over this, they could disappear. So that is going to give us some um, interesting fun when it comes to painting the hull. Uh, what my thought process is will be to um, put a little bit of sponge in each one of the openings and spray paint so that we don't get any paint on the propellers and then brush paint um, at each step um, the insides. That shouldn't be a problem. So this bit of hull is now done, so we need to do the same uh, work on the other side of, um, of the hull on the bow thrusters and then the two halves of the um, hull can come together.
The two um, supports that go into the hull um, just need to make sure that there's no flash or anything that's going to stop them sitting correctly and of course remove the um, gate nubs from having been attached to the sprue. Ensure that you clean up the top one as well because that's going to sit um, in the deck um, and it's going to be a location point for the deck later in the build. So just need to make sure everything's nice and square and not going to give us any problems. Um, including these um, jet pin marks at the top, anything above that line, just make sure you've got no nothing there that's going to get in the way of fitting the deck. Okay, so we're going to use um, a thick tube glue for gluing the hull together, which is my preference when putting ship's hulls together um, because it's a nice uh, thick glue with a slow setting time, which gives me time to manipulate things. So let's get the two hull halves together. So we'll place the female half um, down on my sponge building jig. Then we'll glue in these supports and let them uh, dry and then we will put the male half on top and that's when we'll do all the gluing. Now I'm often asked how did I come to the dimensions of the Queen Mary 2? Well, some of them were actually fixed and still are fixed. First off, the height of the ship, the height from the waterline to the highest point of the ship, which we call the air draft. Well, there's a bridge at the entrance to New York, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, and I was given strict instructions that the air draft of the ship should not be more than 62 metres. So, as I say, from the waterline right to the top of the mast or the top of the funnel mustn't or hadn't to extend beyond 62 metres because that would give us around a nine feet clearance at high tide at the highest point of the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, which is an arc. And so Queen Mary II generally tends to transit under the bridge at the, the centre line which is the highest point of the bridge. So that really determined how high the funnel and the mast and the whole ship could be. And that, that was a physical constraint that I had to work with. Then there was the length. And initially, Queen Mary II used to tie up at the Manhattan Piers in the, the heart of Manhattan on the, the Hudson River. And in conjunction with the available turning space at Southampton docks where the ship would come off of a terminal and sometimes have to be swung around it was judged that 345 meters was the absolute uh, limit that we could have and so that's why the ship is 345 meters long in fact the turning basin at Southampton has now been dredged and uh, is somewhat larger and also Queen Mary II no longer berths in the centre of Manhattan. She, she now berths at Brooklyn where she could have had a, a longer length if um, we had designed the ship that way and sent the ship to, to Brooklyn at the very beginning. Now the draft of the ship is equivalent to the draft of the QE2, 10 metres, and that's somewhat less, about 32 feet, than the 38, 39 feet of the previous Queens. And that was chosen to enable the ship to come and go into Southampton and New York at any state of tide, so she doesn't have to wait for the tide. The previous Queens had to wait off for high tide to come into certainly Southampton 
And so that, that's why the, the draft was restricted to the QE2 draft of, of 10 metres. And I adjusted the beam of the ship as necessary to give me the stability I needed for the, the size of the ship. So that's how the dimensions of the Queen Mary II were originally determined. In steps eight and nine, we are building up the stabilizers. So we have these um, boxes which will hold the stabilizers to the inside of the hull and allow the stabilizer to then swing open as required. Now, the only thing on here we're going to see is the inside surface. So we don't need to worry too much about um, what the outside surface looks like in terms of clean up. Um, but we do want to just give the outside surface um, that, that's going to mate with the hull uh, a gentle sand just to remove any flash or seam so that we have a nice good tight fit and we're not letting any light through um, and have no issues when we come to glue that in place. It's the same on this surface here even though it will be a little bit away any flash from the ejector pins could cause um, an issue when fitting so that's all we need to do with that part. With the stabilizer itself um, depends on whether you've decided to have your stabilizers open or closed so once you've removed the sprue gate nubs off your part um, there is a, a seam to clean up on on each edge um, and on this back end um, and also on the um, support that's holding them um, there is no um, no real reason to sand the rest of it unless you've got some sink in there in which case just um, I, I've got a small amount of sink in mine put a little bit of filler in and just sand it smooth and if you're having these in the closed position that's not going to be seen and so you don't really need to worry about it if you're undecided and um, you're going to have them um, swung in sometimes and, and swung out other times then you will need to do the uh, little bit of filling of the sink marks so again easier to use a flat emery board for cleaning up this part There we go, it's as simple as that, and then we can uh, put that to one side ready for painting. These boxes that um, form the back plate for the stabilizers to swing in and out of have got four very deep ejector pin marks. So we're just filling them with some Mr. Surface. I'm using the 1200 initially, um, then we'll sand it back and we might put the 500 on top if needs be. Um, I've done the other three as you can see so they all have the same issue um, but as this is going to be a very visible surface um, it needs to be done the other method would be to blank the whole thing with uh, some plastic card and glue that in over the top um, but uh, Mr. Service I think will do the job fine so we're making some paint masks now using frisket film um, and the process is very simple. In the areas where it's um, difficult to uh, mask off and make a paint stripe, we're using the paint lines that have been provided on the hull to actually uh, be a guide for making our own paint masks. So what we do, as you can see, is we put the film down over the area that we want to um, have a mask. We'll run a knife along the edge that we want to cut so that we've got a nice um, edge to mask against and then we'll mark off the area so that we know how it fits back so on. You can see here where we've cut the film so the film ends where that little strip of yellow masking tape is which is actually on top of the mask that we've made on the bow um, and then the next thing we need to do is mark off a termination point. So we can now see that that is Done. we've run some masking tape up um, against that edge having a nice 
flat straight edge to terminate against is always handy if that's possible um, and then we've also put a piece of tape on that end where it butts up so we know where that is and then I recommend you take a photograph so it's clear where it is and you can uh, reference um, everything when you put it back in place now between this area at the front and where we end up masking off at the stern it's a straight line so we only really need to go up to say this edge here on the stern and it's exactly the same process so we have our masks made we have the stern and then we can mask our own um, line down the middle when we need to and then we've got masks at the bow so what we need to do now is to remove these and store them safely for when we're ready to paint so simply we're removing the masks carefully and putting them on the inside of this acetate sheet and then we'll be able to store them safely and we can write on the backing paper of the uh, acetate sheet uh, what it is and where it goes so that's all our paint masks made up and stored ready for later. You can see how they can uh, benefit um, where you've not quite got a straight edge, particularly uh, for the shape of the bow. It will make marking up that area when we come to paint a lot, lot easier. So that's it for this video. In the next video we'll be having a look at cleaning up the hull which includes some modifications to both the external and internal areas of the hull uh, before we start laying down some paint. Um, I hope that you can join us um, for that. In the meantime enjoy your modelling, take care everyone and we will see you very soon.